you'll be able to enlighten yourselves with the help of all the experiences and expertise right from the comfort of your own home. In order to benefit law students at a large scale, we have proudly joined hands with lead generation Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, in what is this a collaborative effort. And with that, all that there is left to say before we start is expand your horizons, widen your knowledge, and heighten your courage. We strive for your progress. Profession, awake the professional in you. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Harsha Kabra, President's Council, our eminent guest speaker for this evening's lecture. A, a President's Council of 15 years, Dr. Kabra is a leading figure in many different fields, with commercial law being merely one of them. Dr. Kabra holds a doctorate of corporate law from the University of Canberra and is the chairman of the Tokyo Cement Group. He is a sitting member of the International Chamber of Commerce, International Court of Arbitration in Paris, and a representative member of the Federation of Integrated Conflict Management. Dr. Cabral is also a non-executive -exec director of several listed companies, including Hatton, Hatton National Bank PLC, Demo PLC, and Haley's PLC. Dr. Cabral has also authored several books in the field of company law, intellectual property law, and commercial arbitration. It is with the most enormous amount of pleasure that I invite Dr. Cabral, President's Counsel, to commence today's lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you. It's nice to see you. I can, uh, Praveen is my good friend, President's Counsel, Chandaka Jayasundara's son. I can remember Praveen as an infant. So I'm so glad to see him be hosting today and uh, looking very smart. Very proud of you, Praveen. Thanks, so, good evening, everybody. Well, uh, the topic that has been assigned to me is uh, the practical aspects of commercial litigation. Now, this, I must say, is a very interesting field. So anyone, I'm the budding lawyers I see from the University of Colombo and the Law College. It's, well, your next step is getting into the field of practicing the law, either as a practitioner or as an instructing attorney, or as a judge in the judiciary, or in the attorney general's department, or joining the public sector or the private sector, a bank, so on and so forth. So the commercial knowledge you have acquired either at law school or at the university will be of immense importance as you go along. Now, I must say the importance of commercial law is because uh, it's a happening thing, you know, commerce, the world of commerce is expanding, especially in the digital environment. You would see that the, the aspect of commerce is fast developing than any other field. I know there are a variety of other laws you may want to uh, venture into, but as a, now I am not only a practitioner, I do a little bit of teaching also, lecturing in a couple of places. So there I know that uh, uh, when the students come to get seek our advice to do masters, very often they want to do masters in company law, corporate law, intellectual property law, digital information technology, banking, uh, insurance, right? Very rarely they would want, anyone would come and say that they want to do a masters in partition or uh, say a divorce law, right? So that shows the importance, right? Because it's, it's an area where there is a lot of development and where there is a lot of money and uh, the, the field is very big and like the personal laws. So it is very important for you to get a knowledge, not only on the theoretical aspects, which you have already got at law school and university, but the practical aspects when you see on the other side of the legal practitioner. 
Now, when you say commercial law, it's a very varied field. Firstly, you talk about company law. Secondly, you talk about intellectual property law. Thirdly, you talk about alternate dispute resolution, including commercial arbitration. Then you talk about banking, insurance, admiralty. There are a whole lot of areas, you know, trading, international trade, local trade. You may talk about everything, contracts, individual contracts, commercial contracts. All these come under the umbrella of commercial law and commercial litigation. Now, this has become a very, very interesting and a, a profitable venture for the practitioners, as well as a very important uh, feel for any lawyer that ventures into practice or any other field. So I must say that, you know, there is no magic in commercial law. We also thought long years ago that it was, you know, only a privileged few can venture into that particular area. But thanks to our seniors, we were taught and we learned the correct way. And uh, we now know how to, you know, explain. I've been in the field for a long time. I've been practicing for 33 years. So I can tell you some of my experiences in this particular field of commercial law. In my case, I have been foremost in the, I sort of, you know, all my litigation is uh, in the commercial field, maybe uh, about 60% into uh, intellectual property and maybe 40% into company law and other aspects. So let me tell you what exactly this, uh, as a practitioner's point of view, how you look at commercial law. One thing, you must have a basic understanding. I know the practical side you may not learn at law school or the university. Once you come out, when you practice, when you're doing your apprenticeship, right, you would know that uh, you have to learn a lot as we go along. We also didn't uh, learn these things overnight. It was, you know, it's a long process. And then you must realize this particular field of law, if you're going to practice, it is going to be a stairs game. You have to have a lot of patience, right? You can't start running the same, same, uh, you know, sooner you're born. You have to first crawl, you have to get up, and then it goes slowly, the gradual process has to take place. So you must be very patient in earn, learning the subject. Uh, we were fortunate that we were under seniors who were uh, there to teach us. So that was, you know, that's, a, that's another positive point. But unfortunately, right now for the new uh, commerce, it's very, very hard because the, or most of the chambers, you know, commercial law is restricted to um, few practitioners, unfortunately, I, we would expect more to come into this field. So all these uh, few practitioners chambers are full. If you ask Praveen, I think his father has about uh, 15 to 20 in, in his chamber, right? I have about uh, 16 in my chamber. Mr. Kanagisaran has a large number. Mr. De Silva, Ramesh De Silva has a large number. So these the chambers are full, but unfortunately for the newcomers, even if you don't have a chamber, you can come to court, follow the important cases, you learn and keep one thing in mind. Don't think that this is tough, right? So a lot of people think that, well, we don't know our English properly. So we all, you know, you, me, everybody, we have done our secondary education in Sinhalese, right? Now we lecture, we practice in English. It's a process of, you know, gaining and you must, you need confidence. Don't worry, other people will laugh at you. Don't forget forget about the people who are who will laugh at you. Every day, the people will laugh at you, but that doesn't matter. I mean, there are, you, you can take, there are several, so many examples where people who couldn't express them properly who have become top counsel today. So, the, so it's a case of, you know, learning. You go forward, you learn, you've got to see that, you know, you, one important thing is hard work. There is no substitute to hard work. Then you have the confidence, self-confidence is very important. And ethics. <clears throat> if you want to be in the game, you must be trustworthy, right? Because when the judges get to know that you're a slippery customer, right? Well, that is the end of your journey. But when they leave the station, also they tell the, tell the new judge who is coming in, be careful of those uh, practitioners. They are not honorable. So you've got to keep in mind that hard work will always pay. Just put in hard work, read, do your work properly, and rest will just follow. So what exactly is commercial law? 
I told you, as I told you, commercial law, you know, you have, you have studied sale of goods ordinance, bills of exchange ordinance, law of contract, right? Now that is different to the law of property we have studied. So in commercial law, law, the commercial aspect started with, you know, you have done Roman law. In the 12 tables, this was started, originated with Lex Mercatoria. In the 12 tables, one was mercantile law, which came under Lex Mercatoria, right? Now that included all the subjects I just mentioned. But now when it comes to litigation, the cases are mostly on the topics I have discussed, right? And uh, the most important thing is, long years ago, we had the district courts for all these cases, but then in 1996, there was a court that was created under the High Court uh, Special Provisions Act, all right? Uh, the High Court Special Provisions Act number 10 of 1996 created the Commercial High Court. Now the Commercial High Court was created, that is in the Western province, Commercial High Court was created to cater to the commercial disputes. All commercial disputes were to be, actually when it started in 1996, we had only one court. Now we have three courts, Commercial High Court 1, Commercial High Court 2, Commercial High Court 3. Now, the idea was when we started, now in the act itself, in the schedule, there is a first schedule. First schedule says all commercial transactions arising within the Western province shall be taken up in the Commercial High Court. So all commercial, because you know, Western province is the commercial hub of this country. All commercial transactions, when we started, it was above 1 million. Right now, it has gone up to 20 million, all right? So all commercial transactions above 20 million, the monetary value will be instituted in the commercial high court of the Western province. Now, any other commercial matter falling below 20 million will go to the district court of Palambo or where the jurisdiction takes place, if, if the transaction is in Jaffna, well, if it's below 20 million, you will go to, you'll have to go to the district court of uh, Jaffna. <clears throat> so that is one area. Now that commercial transaction, the definition of commercial transaction is very wide, right? There are judgments by Justice Mark Fernando. There are judgments by uh, Justice uh, Salim Masuf, where the word commercial transaction has been interpreted to be very, very wide. So any transaction which deals with commerce where the monetary value is above 20 million, that will be taken up in the <coughs> commercial high court. <coughs> then we had under schedule one, two was all company law matters. Right at that time, it was under the 17 of 1982. It said all company matters will go to the commercial high court. Now that was all island jurisdiction. Even if the company is in uh, uh, Jaffna, you have to file action in the Western uh, Commercial High Court. Now thereafter, the new Companies Act came into operation, Act number seven of uh, 2007. In that, they have brought in in that the court to mean the commercial high court. So it has all, commercial high court has all island jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis, uh, company matters arising out of the Companies Act. Third one is the Intellectual Property Act. All intellectual property matters, earlier it was under the 52 of 1979. Then there was another act that came, Act number 36, Intellectual Property Act number 36 of 2003. There are again, the court has been defined to be the commercial high court. So you have three categories of cases that, that also all island jurisdiction, even if the infringement takes place in Trincomalee, you have to file institute action in the commercial high court. Now the commercial high court uh, has th threefold jurisdiction that brings in a lot of work. So because of that, we improved the first, there was a second court that was brought in and thereafter the third court because of the workload and now we have commercial court number one, commercial court number two, commercial court number three. In addition, for, uh, you know, under the Arbitration Act 11 of 1995, there are applications to be made to the High Court. Now that also, that the Act says High Court of Colombo. That of course, administratively, we are brought into the commercial High Court number uh, three. Right? So all arbitration matters, 
also come commercial arbitration matters. That is for enforcement, setting aside of the award, a few other uh, applications that has to be made under the Act, all to be made under the Commercial High Court. Now, the advantage of the Commercial High Court is, unlike in the olden days, from the District Court, you have to go to the Court of Appeal, from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. Even now, if it is a district court action, from the district court, you go to the civil appellate appeal of the province and from there to the Supreme Court. Now, from the commercial high court, it is a one-stop shop. From the commercial high court, you go direct to the Supreme Court. So the time frame, you know, at all commercial matters have been reduced so that the people of commerce know exactly that the time they spent on litigation is far less compared to the traditional way of doing uh, litigation, where you have a longer period. Now that appellate court period, when I was talking about from the district court to the, the commercial, uh, to the court of appeal, to the Supreme Court would take sometimes 10 to 15 years, right? The appellate procedure. Now with the Supreme, now with the commercial high court, all actions that are instituted in the commercial high court can go straight to the Supreme Court. You have to get obtain leave from Supreme Court, which is a straightforward thing. So very often, if you can't obtain leave in the Supreme Court, well, the matter ends there. You may get your injunction, you may get your permanent injunction, interim injunctions, challenges go to the Supreme Court. So this is, a, uh, this is an institution, the Commercial High Court, which has attracted a lot of prominence. And I must say that it is one of the uh, success stories in our judicial system. You know, we have laws, delays, system has been criticized for loss delays. Sometimes, you know, a normal case can go from five years to 10 years to 25 years. But our commercial ICO structure has been brought in that this has shortened the time frame, even if there are appeals. And since there are competent judges who are appointed to the commercial high court, even the appeals are far lesser than the normal appeals you see in an appellate court. So all commercial transactions, all company law cases and all intellectual property cases and all cases arising out of commercial arbitration are instituted in the commercial high court. Now that definitely is a plus point. Now these are the, now when you say commercial transactions, it can be on sale of goods, it can be on an international trade transaction, it can be on a bill of exchange, it can be an insurance transaction, it can be a normal leasing transaction, high purchase transaction, there are so many commercial matters that can come under the commercial transaction. I told you that's why the, the definition of commercial transaction is absolutely wide. So there are so many cases that are reported under the uh, commercial transactions starting from 1996. To date, we have, that's one of the first success stories of the commercial high court. You would see a large number of cases have been decided in the commercial high court and also reported cases in the Supreme Court. You know, you bypass the Court of Appeal, you bypass the, the, the other uh, provincial high court so that from the district court to the provincial high court to the Supreme Court, but here from commercial high court straight away to the Supreme Court. And I, as I told you, because of the competence of the judges in the commercial high court, we have been very fortunate from the day from 1996 to date, uh, we have had fine judges in the um, Commercial High Court, and it has been a it has been a good experience in appearing before those judges, competent judges. And uh, unless there is a very very good reason to appeal, we may not appeal to the Supreme Court. So all those matters I discussed come up in the commercial transactions under the Commercial High Court, right? All in the Western Province. So then number two will be the all transactions arising out of the Companies Act. As I told you, with the creation of the Companies Act number seven of 2007, all actions, the, the court is decide, defined as the Commercial High Court. Now, mind you, the Companies Act has 534 sections. You know, company law is basically, it's like a, if you talk about a human being, a human being's life is from the birth certificate to death certificate, right? You're born, then you're, you, you have to get your birth certificate. You know, if you don't get your birth certificate, you have a huge problem. You, know, you can't uh, get, into, get into a school, you can't get your passport, you can't do anything. Imagine your life without a birth certificate. Then 
you're a kid, then you become a teenager, then you get a job, then you get married, then you have children, then your old age comes, and then at 70 or 80 or 90, you might die. And then again, you need a death certificate, right? Now, mind you, without a death certificate, you can't do a lot of things. You can't even bury without a death certificate. You can't have your testamentary case without a death certificate. So the human being's life is between the birth certificate to the death certificate. That's the life cycle of a human being. In the same way, in a company, a corporate body, the lifespan of a corporate body is between the certificate of incorporation and to the death certificate of the company, which is the striking of the, of the registration by the registrar of companies. Now, what transpires in between, between the certificate of incorporation and the striking of certificate, right? is called company law. Now, if I were to teach you company law, I will take 12 months to teach all these aspects, incorporation of the company, what are what is uh, articles of association, uh, what is, uh, uh, who are the directors, board of directors, shareholders, uh, cap share capital, then uh, how can there are different types of share capital, that is you have the initial share issue, you have the rights issue, you have the bonus issue, then uh, uh, transactions of other debentures and whatever with regard to companies. Then uh, you must have a board of directors to run the company. You know, the shareholders don't run companies. If shareholders were to run companies, millions of shareholders of John Keels will be running John Keels. No, it's a simple principle that shareholders don't run companies, but shareholders appoint a board of directors who would then again run the company. You will have a chairman, you have a managing director, you have a board of directors, account uh, director finance, director marketing, directors the statistics, you have a whole lot of things. So all that is governed by the articles of association. That's the internal document. That is like the constitution. You know, a country must have a constitution. You know, you, we have a constitution, we have separation of powers. The, you know, now we have the present constitution, 79, we had 48 independence constitution, 72 republican constitution, then we had the 78 uh, Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka constitution. Now that 78 constitution, now we have just got the 20th amendment. We have had 20 amendments. And which talks, uh, talks about separation of powers. That is the judiciary headed by the chief justice, uh, executive headed by the president, and the parliament legislature uh, headed by the prime minister. Now these have to work harmoniously. You know, they cover a couple of issues where there was conflict between these, right? about uh, not in 2000 October, 2018 October, where the executive tried to uh, capture the, the, ultimately the judiciary had to come and save the situation. So, you know, that type of situation. So all the internal management document, actually in uh, countries like New Zealand, articles of association is known as the constitution of the country. In Sri Lanka, we still follow the British mechanism and we call it articles of association. It's an internal document. It's a contract between the shareholders per se and the shareholders with the company. So you have the incorporation, you have shares, you have a board of directors, you have articles of association, then you have meetings, right? There are two types of meetings. You have the shareholders meetings and you have the board of directors meeting, directors meetings. Now you can have any amount of all that is governed by your articles. You can have a board meeting in the morning, you can have a board meeting in the evening. That's no issue at all. Now, uh, you can have a board meeting under a tree. There's nothing, but the law says shareholders meetings are two types. You have the extraordinary shareholder meeting or the EGM and the AGM, what you hold once a year, annual general meeting. What notices to be given? What are requisitions? How, what sort of notice should be given? What is an ordinary resolution? What is a special resolution? All those are there in the Companies Act. I told you there are 534 sections. Uh, from 134 to 100, uh, 134, yes, to 127 deals with meetings, notices, shareholders, shares, when to give uh, uh, special resolution. Now, Section 93 deals with on such situations, you can, you can give special, you, you need a special resolution. Section 92 deals with ordinary resolutions, right? So all that is clearly set out in the law. So then, uh, you must always know, that's why we always advise, if you have, don't ever advise your clients to have 50-50, you know, that is fish nor fowl, you'll be creating a conflict by, if you have 51%, that's great, 
51% majority, 49. For 51, you will have three directors, and for 49, there will be two directors. So then you have share control and board control. You can pass an ordinary resolution with 51%. Then if you have 75%, it's even better, because with 75%, you can pass a special resolution. All right. So then if you have 85%, under section 144 of the Companies Act, you can even pass a circular resolution. So these are the magic numbers, 51, 75, and 85, right? So these are with regard to meetings, shareholders meeting, whatever, whatever. Then you have to enter into contracts. Company has to borrow money, right? You go to the banks, lending institutions, financial institutions, raise money because you need money to, right? They have to borrow money. They are not very often businesses. You don't run on your own money. You have to borrow money for your projects. So you have to enter into company contracts. Then there'll be disputes, directors disputes, directors versus directors, directors, shareholders among themselves, majority shareholders fighting with the minority shareholders, then shareholders fighting with the company, right? So sometimes company fighting with some other company. So these are the, the disputes you would see in where you, you call them company litigation. Right now, that is where the lawyers have a lot of work. Right, very common is oppression mismanagement. Sections 224, 225, then uh, uh, 234 derivative action, then 128 uh, rectification of the share register, the shareholders' rights, who is a shareholder. All those are called shareholder remedies. What are the shareholder remedies? Majority shareholder remedies, minority shareholder remedy, exit options. That's where the lawyers. I mean. Um, uh, for lawyers like Chandaka and me, it is like bread and butter because of, uh, we, we, we believe on those cases. So as practitioners, we know, right? If you can, uh, Praveen can help you. We have a discussion with Chandaka. He's one of the finest uh, lawyers, uh, he, the best lawyer in admiralty law, right? And in addition to all the other areas he practices, you can ask him to explain about the chamber work. What sort of chamber work is involved for a, a commercial practitioner? He has large experience. Uh, we were in the same chamber of Dr. Kanagisparan. We learned a lot from our guru. And we try to emulate the, you know, that type of litigation, how exactly it works. So getting back to the topic. So then you have uh, disputes. Then we go on. And then suddenly, the company can't you lack like the man at 80, 90, uh, lack of oxygen, that is lack of funds. Finances, uh, you have a problem in raising finances for the company, then you wind up the company. Now, winding up is twofold. Either the creditors winding up or the members winding up. There are again, lawyers come in. You can't just close shop and go. So after all that, you go to the registrar and say, well, I want to close shop, remove my name from the registrar, uh, register of uh, the, the company registry. Now see, what happens between the certificate of incorporation and that particular death certificate is the life cycle of a corporate body. Now, if we were to teach company law uh, in a class, we will I will take one year for that, maybe one month for incorporation, one month for articles, the three months for director's duties, one month for shares, share capital, there are different types of shares, then another month for meetings, then another one for company disputes, another month for winding up, you see? That is how the syllabus is structured. If you look at the Companies Act, all the entire 534 sections deal, deals with all these aspects, right? Maybe in your apprenticeship period with a senior, you will learn more. If you go and follow a case, you would uh, learn more about this. There are so many cases, interesting cases, even right now, if you walk into the commercial high court, you would see, high powered uh, corporate litigation taking place all on the sections I just mentioned, right? So that is with regard to company law. Then your, your, the subject matter is only 534 sections. I would advise you, is, there is no magic. Just read the act. If you read it twice, and if you read it three times, you master it. If you, have, if you can have the patience to read it five times, you'll be an expert on that. There is no magic whatsoever, right? I can tell you now, I'm happy, happy. We, we, of course, with our experience, we were compelled to go through all this. So if it's in your mind, you know, you must have a clear idea of what corporate litigation is all about. You must have a bird's eye view, right? A lot of the, the problem we lawyers have is we try to look at one particular section and go to court. 
which, which is totally wrong. If you want to be a good lawyer, understand the subject, read up, because there are enough and more textbooks. There are local textbooks, there are international textbooks. You have your additional notes given for, by the university, given by the law school. All that is there, but the subject matter is whether you know your statute properly. The company is Act 7 of 2007. So far, we haven't had, except for one amendment, there are a few amendments coming all in the pipeline and which will maybe passed in parliament in a, a month or two. So that's with regard to corporate litigation. Company litigation is very important for any practitioner who wants to do commercial litigation, right? You, you, there is no commercial litigation without corporate litigation. Then another important area is intellectual property law, right? Now, intellectual property law, I told you, the Act number, Intellectual Property Act number 36 of 2003 has 213 sections, right? It is very well structured. It is based on the uh, TRIPS, it's a TRIPS compliant law. From the WTO, they have given us the TRIPS agreement, Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement, right? It has 234 sections. Now it's so well structured from sections five to 27 deals with copyright. You mean the entire law of copyright is in only 22 sections, right? Then sections 28 to 61 deals with industrial designs, right? Then from 62 to 100 is patents, right? Entire law of patents or patents or whatever you call it, it's there. Then from sections 101 to 145, you find trademarks. Trademarks, trade names, device marks, designs, so on and so forth. Then 146 to 159, you find integrated circuits, right? And then from 160, 160, 160 is a very important section, which deals with unfair competition and undisclosed information. Now, unfair competition is the, basically the passing off we have been talking about. You know, you try to piggyback on somebody else's mark. And 160 subsection six is undisclosed information, right? Now, undisclosed information, you have trade secrets. That is why you have non-disclosed agreements. That's a very important area. There are so many cases right now under uh, the, this particular undisclosed information, 160 subsection six. Then 161 is another very interesting area of geographical indications, right? The, the Ceylon tea, Sri Lanka tea, the Sri Lanka cinnamon, right? We say, for example, champagne has to come from the champagne district. You can't have you from the United States. You say, for example, Scotch whiskey has to come from Scotland. You can't get Scotch whiskey from, uh, uh, say, another country. You see, so. For example, say for example, Rune Mikiri has to come from Rune and not from. Uh... So that is the beauty of geographical indications, right? So that's another area, very specialized area. Then you have sections 170, the civil remedies, right? What are your civil remedies? Go to the commercial high court, get your injunctions, damages, commercial uh, uh, profits, interim injunctions, some, something similar to Anton Pillar order. All those civil remedies you obtain from the commercial high court. Then from sections 177 to 203 deals with offenses and penalties. That is for your criminal liability. If you want to get some action, you want to get some search warrant or whatever, you have to go to the magistrate of that particular area. If the infringement takes place in Vattala, you've got to go before the Vattala magistrate. So you have on 170, the civil remedy, then you have the criminal remedy on the other side, then you have border control, right? Sections 206, section 207 deals with border control, exports, imports, the director general of customs has the power to come in and uh, do whatever that is relevant for duplicates or copies or whatever, right? So you would see, now, now though there are 213 sections, say for example, in 22 copyright, you don't have to study 22 sections for, of copyright. There again, section six deals with what are protected works. Now that is very important because computer software has been listed. Work. Maybe your painting, maybe your photograph, maybe your uh, sculpture, all those are protected works. And it's not a registrable right yet. You don't have to register it in Sri Lanka. From the moment you do it, you have copyright. That is why you put that C mark. You see, no one can infringe it. 
the law of intellectual property is how do you get it how do you keep it and how do you protect it right it's a personal right so how do you get it is very important the law now 22 i section 6 protected works section 9 economic rights section 10 moral rights then section 22 how to get your remedies injunction damages so on and so forth the same we and industrial designs what is an industrial i told you from sections 28 to 61 deals with industrial designs what is an industrial design how to get it uh, how to transfer it how to assign it how to license it the registered owners rights now that's a very important section section 47 what are the registered owners right of an industrial design now mind you industrial design unlike copyright has to be registered in sri lanka if you don't register that you won't get a design right you have to get that certificate once you get that you have a monopoly for three times every time five years five years five years for 15 years you can uh, register you can have a monopoly on industrial designs then from 62 to 100 you get patents now in patents you have a registrable right unlike industrial designs once you register your patent you have a monopoly for 20 years that's another important very interesting area what is a patent 60 61 what is a patent how do you get it how what is patentability what is novelty what is prior what are the registered owners rights section 84 gives the registered owners rights then how to assign it how to transfer it how to nullify it how to remove it all that is there then you have trademarks that's a absolutely important area trademarks area from section 101 to 145 there are again you can register it or if you want you can be without registry if you register it it's very easy because you know that it's very easy to show your registration certificate it's like a property if you have a deed it's very easy to show well this is my right to this particular property otherwise you got to establish i am the prior user i have used this so on and so forth so everything what is a trademark what is a trade name what is a design how to get it how to register it how to assign it how to transfer it how to nullify it how to remove it all that is there in there again you have to know 103 104 object uh, third party right uh, uh, objective grounds then the rights of a registered owner 121 right 144 is trade name you know you inter- incorporate a company from the moment you incorporate that company you have a right to use it now say you uh, derick david peris motor company you don't have to register it as a trademark it's a trade name automatically you give and you can use the abbreviations also dpmc you don't have to separately register but if you put a device you can put a trademark also so you would see you have the uh, patents designs copyright trademarks integrated circuits all those properly brought now there is a large number of cases we institute in this particular area in the commercial high court alone between 50 to 100 cases are instituted every year so imagine you could just come and follow these cases so interesting all are absolutely interesting cases right Uh, whether it's international trademark or coca cola or apple or uh, asterix or it's a copyright mark or songs or lyrics or poems these all come under copyright and now it's highly important because information technology the software regime comes under intellectual property so there are a lot of scope in that so then you have all these cases in the commercial high court in addition you have a lot of arbitrations cases that come up under arbitration act number 11 of 1995 there are various situations you got to go to the court to enforce the award you have to go to court to set aside the award you have to go to court sometimes there is a problem in a point in the arbitrators you got to go to court right you get summoned sometimes you have to go to court under 11 of 1995 arbitration act so when you take all these different statutes read along with the commercial high court act that is act number 10 of 1996 which created the commercial high court you find commercial litigation now i'm talking about the commercial litigation that is the 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 true commercial litigation we have to look at that is on corporate litigation intellectual property litigation any commercial transaction i mentioned or the arbitration matters right petty matters may go still go to the district court of the area or whatever so they are broadly speaking commercial litigation has a lot of scope 
when young lawyers get into the field of law, there'll be a whole lot of scope that you will have to discuss with, in, with regard to commercial litigation. Now, if I may pause for a moment, this is where, right? Now you would think, well, there are large numbers. All these chambers are full, but I must tell you, there is enough scope for the hardworking student, the young lawyer who is prepared to sacrifice, read up all this, do put in a lot of hard work with a lot of determination, self-determination, I told you, and a lot of courage, right? You have a lot of scope in this particular area of commercial litigation, but you have to carry your books now as commercial practitioners. I carry, I have a booklet. This also I learned from seniors. Uh, I carry the Companies Act. I carry, carry the Intellectual Property Act. I carry the uh, Arbitration Act. I carry the Constitution. I carry the Civil Procedure Court. I carry the Judicature Act and the Evidence Ordinance. This is my bundle of books, right? So everything what I have done in my practice is, with, is within these three, few books. So it's no magic to master it. If you're practicing it the same thing over and over again, you master it. So the commercial aspect of litigation is fairly simple, right? And it's very interesting. And that's why I would encourage the young lawyers, the budding lawyers, just coming out of the law school and the university to enter into these areas, learn well, and take up the challenge and get into the field of commercial litigation. Now, this is broadly speaking what uh, commercial litigation is all about. So now I'm going to leave it to you. The audience will have to ask questions. I was asked to give a couple of minutes for questions and Praveen will, uh, I believe, uh, coordinate. You are free to ask any question from any section of the Companies Act. There are 534 sections of the Companies Act. There are 213 sections of the Intellectual Property Act. There are 50 sections of the Arbitration Act. You're free to ask any question any commercial matter, whether it's sale of goods, local trade, international trade, law of contracts, right? feel free to ask any question. And uh, I will try to explain and tell you the nitty gritties of commercial litigation in Sri Lanka. Over to you, uh, Praveen. Thank you very much, sir. That was, a, that was a wonderful session. And I gained a lot from that as I'm sure did everyone else participating in today's session. I'll, uh, we'll quickly move on to the question and answer session. Here, the right, we really rough. So it's 4:45. Roughly have around 15 minutes. If you have a question, whether it be in English or Sinhala, that's fine. We can accommodate both languages. Um, you can present your question uh, to yeah, sir. Yeah. Whatever you may uh, have to ask. Uh, just can before that, please. Uh, just uh, before you start speaking, just raise your, uh, use the raise hand uh, option on this platform so that I know who's speaking and that uh, we can, I can, okay. I think Tilanka Fernando, you can, you yes, can ask. Yes, uh, my question is, sir, uh, these uh, insurance claims uh, for this corporate litigation, insurance claims are coming under which section? What is the statute, sir? No, insurance is a contract, Puta. Insurance okay. is basically a contract between two parties. You know, you know, if you know that you raised it. Uh, yeah. A contract is an agreement between, that's Hallsbury's definition of a contract. Contract is an agreement between two parties, which is enforceable in a court of law. So in the contract, you have the definition, number one. Number two is an agreement, offer and acceptance. There are a whole lot of rules regarding of all rules regarding acceptance. Then there is form, what form of a contract, written, uh, notarial, oral, then capacity to contract, then uh, the, the consideration of a contract. Then uh, you have, that is law of contract, 10, 10 points, then legality of object, then reality of consent, then uh, conditions, warranties, exemption clauses, then how the contract comes to an end, and then the remedies for breach. So there are 10 points in contracts. If I were to teach you law of contract, that'll take one year for that. Now, in that you see, insurance is also one. It's a contract between two parties, insurance company and you. Now in that contract, they, it will say dispute resolution. Now in most of the insurance contracts, one is 
if the entire uh, the, the claim is rejected you go to the court you have a right of action to go to court but in most of the insurance contracts if they say if there is a dispute on the quantity because the quantum for example say i ask for 100 million and you the insurance company is paying me only 50 million for that dispute you have to go for arbitration that is in the contract itself so there is no law as such then unlike okay. company law intellectual property so it's a it's a contract between two parties which will set out how to uh, deal with your problem in a dispute yeah brother okay so thank you very much sir. and those matters are taken up at the commercial high courts commercial high court if it's the if the value is about 20 million okay thank you very much sir it's clear thank you very much yeah. all the matters will still go to the district court of colombo okay so thank you thank you mr fernando i think we have a question from mr gaesh on jayasundara you can have the floor if you Mr. Gayashan, you have your hand raised. Is it to ask a question? Yes, sorry, uh, I did not. Okay. okay, if I may, sir, my uh, question is not uh, directed to uh, litigation per se. It's directed to entering the uh, practice of commercial law. So, yes. sir, what would your advice be to a first generation lawyer entering into the commercial law practice? And uh, additionally, I would like to know if uh, entering, uh, if getting into a LLM would be more practical or would uh, getting into the field and uh, learning through experience be the mo most practical way of uh, learning the uh, area. Yeah, now now the situation is most of the students, just because you're in the study mode, when you just finish your first degree and your LLB, you're in your study mode, it's easy to continue and finish your uh, master's LLM, right? That's one way so that before you, because then you'll have the time initially when you that during the time you are doing your apprenticeship or maybe your first year, second year, you have adequate time. So I, I would advise to finish up if you're keen in doing higher studies, uh, do your higher studies early in life so that you know you have enough time to then, because that's the theoretical side you're learning, right? So that is why your higher studies will venture into LLM and then the practice is totally different. Now, once you come to practice after your LLB and attorneys and whatever other qualifications, you will realize that's a totally different ball game. You see? So it's the, the practice of law is totally different to, I mean, you will never get a uh, plaint you have drafted for civil procedure examination, right? This is straightforward. But uh, the plaint you draft for an intellectual property case or a company law case, a petition is totally different to what you have learned. So that you have to learn. That is where you need to uh, get a proper senior, right? and uh, maybe follow a few cases in the uh, commercial high courts. Uh, even if you fail to get a senior, try to uh, even uh, whoever senior who does that type of work to learn some, uh, I think even the practical training lectures would help you a lot. But then uh, if you're interested in commercial law, I would say you must always read up uh, the, the financial times, what's happening in society, you know, we must know what exactly, uh, what is the corporate world is all about, what is uh, the, the, say for example, the securities regime, what is the SEC, you know, the securities regime consists of the Securities Exchange Commission, Colombo Stock Exchange, the central depository system, how it works for listed companies, what is the difference between an ordinary company and a listed company, right? Uh, so you would have to see how these works, that, but initially, I would say, if you're interested in that particular area, might as well uh, read up the statutes first. May it be Companies Act, may it be the Intellectual Property Act, may it be the, uh, say, the Arbitration Act. Then you would get some idea, and then you go, go with the senior and well learn, because when everybody, I mean, if the thing is, if it may, maybe in your first year, second year, third year, I believe even in up to your first five years, you will not know exactly where will you be heading. 
right? You, whether you're going to practice, whether you're going to join the AG's department, whether you're going to become a practitioner so per se or instructing attorney or whatever, you see? Because when it comes to practice, well, you realize that you should be good in your submissions in court, right? You must be able to get up and talk in court. That also overnight you won't get, I mean, you, that comes with experience. Then your written work, written submissions, your drafting, drafting skills, right? And then uh, your research work, all those have to come together. So very, very, I mean, if you take 10, 15, we have large chambers, you know, if you take a lot of students, well, maybe three or four will shine on that. Sometimes some are good at research and drafting, but not good in uh, addressing court. Some are good at addressing court, but not good in their research work and drafting. In addition to that, in our chambers, we do a lot of chamber work. I'm sure Praveen will explain, he, he would have witnessed all this. What chamber work is all about? You clients come, they have their problems. This is like going to an expert or a, uh, or a specialist doctor. You know, you have your problem. Then you come, you must be able to give the answers, right? You give opinions. You have written opinions, written legal opinions, oral opinions, right? And discussions. So all that is commercial litigation per se. Right. So you have the chambers where the commercial chambers of a commercial lawyer. So if you, you must first have the, you know, start somewhere well and experience this, you must read up books and then take an interest and uh, then decide, well, what you're planning to do. But I would say, well, that's a very good field. And maybe finishing your LLM early is a better option. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> I think uh, Mr. Gunatilaka, Hassala Gunatilaka, you may ask your question. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, can I know uh, if there are any uh, specific laws uh, relating to the construction industry in Sri Lanka? And I, uh, I also like uh, for you to give a remark about whether those laws are adequate for the scope of the industry. Yeah, one, well, that's a very good question. Construction industry per se doesn't have laws as such because, you know, Puta, construction is always on contracts. Now, say if you want to put up a house, right, you will first talk to an architect and then to a contractor. So then you sit and draft a contract, right? There is a, either a tripartite contract or you will have one contract with your con architect, another contract with your contractor. Now, in those contracts, you have a dispute resolution clause. So that's another contract. So there is no law as such for construction contracts. Now, there are rules under ICTA, right? The engineers, institutes, and so many other places, how to draft this contract, right? So in most of the construction contracts, you have commercial arbitration as the dispute resolution mechanism, right? You, in arbitration, there are two types of arbitration the institutional arbitration and ad hoc arbitration. If it's institutional arbitration, you can name the institute, whether it's ICLP locally or ICC or SIAC, Singapore International Arbitration Center. For example, when uh, China uh, construction company wants to uh, do the Southern Expressway, they will enter into a contract with RDA. So RDA and the China man enters into a contract and in that, that contract China man doesn't want Sri Lankan law and Sri Lankan courts. Sri Lankan RDA doesn't want uh, Chinese court and uh, China law. So what is the compromise? They agree let this uh, agreement be by English law and dispute resolution under SIAC rules, Singapore International Arbitration Center rules. So that will be in Singapore under the uh, they have a Maxwell's chamber in Singapore where they go and do the arbitration there. So that's perfect. Both the independent players. So it can be SIAC, it can be HKIAC, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. It can be the DIAC, DIAC, Dubai International Arbitration Center. It can be London Court of International Arbitration, LCIA. It can be Australia International Arbitration Center. All over the world, there are arbitration centers. They have ICC rules. They have SIAC rules, Chinese rules. This is how the construction work operates, right? If it's an individual contract, well, you're, you and your, you, you want to put up a house, then the contract, those are contracts. So there is no hard and fast rule, 
right? That is a lacuna. We have to bring laws to this problem because there is a problem, what we see in the construction field. But all these are private contracts, right? Not like a, a arbitration, not like a company law or intellectual property. There is no statute per se to govern it. I hope you got it. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there's uh, one question that was sent to me via a message. Yeah. Uh, it is for a lawyer who wishes to get to the field of corporate law. Is it advisable to start off at a firm or should one join a chamber? What are the pros and cons of both? Uh, first of all, you must know the difference between a firm and an individual practitioner. Now, myself, Chandaka, we are individual practitioners, right? That is, you know, long years ago, uh, the, we had this uh, separation between the advocates and proctors. After 1972, we are all attorneys at law, right? Now, the difference between advocate and proctor is sim similar to what happens in England, the barrister and solicitor. Barrister is a person who appears in court. Solicitor is a person who does office work, right? Now we, as uh, practitioners, though we are, uh, we go as counsel. Now you can't, the president's counsel, we are the people who appear in court, right? And the instructing attorneys, now we still have instructing attorneys. When I appear, I would say, okay, I appear with so-and-so, instructed by, okay, Julius and Greasy, right? So now your question is whether you should start with a law firm or an individual counsel. Now, if you can get into a council's uh, chambers, that will be ideal because you do the research, you do the hard work, you do, because most of the work that is done by the instructing firm is not that part. They don't draft, right? They would file the papers that the council drafts, right? Now they would do, uh, like we as council, we never do notarial work, but the instructing attorneys do notarial work. So the role played by the instructing attorneys may be whether it's Julius and Chris, your J. Andy Jerem, the NFP Serum, Varnas, Sudat Perra, right? And Iti and Associates, all those are instructing firms, right? They have, they have their research team, they have their lawyers, they have uh, uh, notarial work, so on and so forth, but they don't appear in court. The appearance is done by counsel. They only instruct. So you get a better exposure, right? So you have to decide whether you're going to be an instructing attorney or if you want to do that part of work, you know, solicitor's work, notary, uh, uh, an advocate's work, it is better to, though you're called attorney at law initially, right? You, it's better to join the law firm, right? A lot depends. I mean, you can do very well in that aspect as well. You end up as a senior practitioner, senior partner of that firm, right? And uh, they have very, very prominent senior partners in this organization, but they have also gone through them. They have, so, but the approach is different. They will not make submissions in court. Here as the council will make a submission in court. So you've got to decide, well, well, to gain, you have to decide, okay, if you want to do, if you're more on to that side, might as well, you would, you know, you, you prefer an office job, well, that's the place. Then if you're planning to be a counsel, it is much better to go do an do apprenticeship with the counsel and gain experience of, you know, initially we have all done that. Maybe your apprenticeship period, maybe your first two, three years, you'll be still carrying books and walking behind your senior. It doesn't matter. You learn a lot with by doing that, right? Your friends will laugh at you. People have laughed at us also. What does that fellow do? Only carry books and go behind that senior. That is okay. But then you learn. By carrying books, you learn. You are compelled to sit and listen to submissions, listen to the, then you are compelled to do research work. Right? So, but books are there. Now it's very easier. I mean, long years ago, when we started practice, we had to go to Salaka to take a photocopy. Right? We, we now, of course, everything is there. You can email is there. there were those days, cut and cutting and pasting was actually physical cutting and pasting. Right? We used to do first draft, second draft, and long years ago when we started, we used to, they didn't have uh, copies, so we used to keep a carbon copy under the, this thing and write so that there is a copy. So now it's very easy. Technology has, you know, brought in a lot of other things. So depending on what you're planning to do, you know, but don't worry you, if your work is good, if you're hardworking, if you're, if you're prepared to take a challenge, wherever you start, 
you will do well don't worry about you know whether it's because uh, it's sometimes it's too early for you to decide whether which which route you would take whether you're going to end up as a judge or join the AGS department or join a bank or an instructing firm or a practitioner right and large batches i mean you know, large batches but you know when you look back and don't think that only the brilliant ones will do well we also had some brilliant ones with, with us but well when you look at the practice well it's not really the brilliant ones who have really done well right who, who some people whom we never thought have done very well in the profession so it's you it's a challenge you take and that's why i always say don't worry about the english don't worry about everything you have to take courage and go forward okay so we've gone over the 15 minutes but there's one person who's raised their hand is that okay so yeah no no question not a problem okay uh, buddhima pereira i think you can ask yes sir question. i am still a school sir yes as uh, i am still a school student and i have no question with, with regard to litigations and all the commercial acts uh, my yeah, question is very simple uh, it's related to websites and i have a website uh, related to educational matters okay uh, and i and i saw in some groups uh, some people sharing my my own uh, ideas and some things in my website uh according to your law is there any any measure that i can take against them yeah it's, it is not my law puta it's copyright <laughs> under the intellectual property act right yeah i under mean the that... copyright yeah in the copyright world there is whatever you create you have to protect right and the other thing is now with the internet and there is a huge problem with regard to this file sharing and also copy right so you have to protect your right and see when it comes to copying it has to be substantive copying what are the, the things that are in the public domain you will not have exclusivity right i will give you an example there is a nice uh, young uh, there is a good he was now he is on his own uh, mr tisha veragoda he is a top photographer and uh, when he was in my chamber he had taken some photographs he had a web page and in that web page he had taken he had a couple of photographs with his copyright mark right is a very good mark he had taken a lovely photograph of the sandakada pahana right in anuradhapura and it was in his so they have to if they one wants to use it has to pay him and get his authority to do it then this in the newspaper divaina newspaper article appeared with this boy's sandakada pahana picture and even the copyright message is also there so he wrote to the company and they said well you are infringing my rights they replied and said you have no right in the sadakata ban we said no we don't have right in the sadakata ban but that particular photograph we have right that is copyright then because of that we had to just to prove a point we went to court and ultimately we won the case they settled it for 100000 we didn't take the money that 100000 was given to the victoria home for the incurables but that is to prove a point so in your case you will have to first see whether you have actual novelty and copyright in your and whether they under the copyright law whether they are infringing any of your rights right and then if there is substantive copying then you can take action that is the issue in your thank, but thank in, you much, in your area in your area but there is a lot of copying going on in the software industry yes i got it thank you very much welcome So there's one more short question. Is that okay? Okay, okay, no worries. Okay, okay, it's, uh, it says it's a text question. It says, "Is it possible? Sorry, uh, is it possible for you to ask to ask sir to explain a little bit on letter of credit and how it practically applies to the real world?" Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, in international trade, right? You know, local trade. Local trade is you go to the shop and buy a loaf of bread. you pay is 60 rupees and the bread is given right over the counter that is local trade international trade is if you are selling garments from sri lanka and the buyer is from hong kong so you are here buyer is in hong kong now in international trade there are a couple of things you got to think above the normal trade one is how to make payment 
right? Is it, I mean, he's not just giving you cash and collecting the money, right? So how to pay, uh, the mode of payment, in what currency to pay, right? Where to pay? Now, those are matters that will come in international trade. In addition, there are a couple of other things. Transport, whether it's air cargo, sea cargo, how to send it. Then number three is insurance. During the uh, transit, if something happens, who is responsible? Seller is responsible or buyer is responsible? So your question is on the first part. In international trade, how does the transaction cost of that takes place? The, uh, uh, the, the most commonest and accepted way <clears throat> in international trade, there are UCP rules, Uniform Custom Practices, right? UCP 600. And there is something called the INCO terms, right? What is a ship contract? What is a FOB contract? What is a CIF contract? So here you are talking about the monetary transaction. In the letter of credit, how it operates is because people don't see now the man who is buying uh, the garments from Sri Lanka doesn't know anything about the quality of the gum. So they work through banks, right? So in a letter of credit, uh, banks get involved. You have the buyer's bank and the seller's bank. Now it is a transaction of documents, right? Now, once the, so you asked your buyer to open a letter of credit in your favor, right? Into your bank, you're, you're, you're the beneficiary bank. Once that is done, you hand over the documents to the, uh, you and hand over the documents, the, the uh, the shipping documents to the uh, invoice and the shipping documents to your bank. Then your bank tells the other, the, the buyer's bank, now the ship goods have been shipped according to the documents, right? Here we have the documents. Then those documents are sent to the buyer's bank, right? Once the buyer receives that, he can give it to the uh, the, the buyer's bank gives it to the buyer and the buyer takes that document to the ship and collects it. Now for the buyer's bank to release the documents to the buyer, the buyer has to make payment. So the buyer's bank will sell uh, the transfer the money to the seller's bank. Right? So this is called the letter of credit trans LCs, letter of credit transaction. Because you don't deal with the uh, one-to-one, -one, you deal through the buyer's bank and the seller's bank. It's a bank transaction and you have credibility because the banks work on rules, regulations, INCO terms, UCP 600, and also they have responsibility to check. Now, the, the, you won't get the, the your, even your bank uh, has to be satisfied that the proper documents come to him. That is after shipping. If you have asked for two containers and if you, you have shipped only one container, he would not release the total money. So the, it's a bank to bank operation. That is the safest mode of doing international trade. If you do a masters in international trade, you will learn more of this mechanism or the mode. Good question. Okay, thank you very much. So I think those are, that's all the questions we have for you. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much. So on behalf of Pro Studies, I know you're a very busy gentleman and for you to take uh, an hour and a half off on a Saturday evening to guide us young budding lawyers and whoever else may be listening, we are really grateful, sir. And personally for me, I didn't even need to do anything to keep me interested because everything you spoke about was so relevant and so interesting. So we're really grateful for you, sir. Thank you very much. It's much pleasure. And I'm so happy to see you. I'm, uh, uh, Raveen, I told you as a kid, I used to see you as an infant, you have <laughs> prospered and wish you all the very best and all your friends. Take the challenge and take the thing and run. You will have a lot of scope there available for hardworking, good students. So wish you all the very best. And anytime you all are free to contact me for any clarification. Thank you so much. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy teaching, so please feel to contact me anytime you want. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. On Take behalf care. of the participants and uh, pro studies and the faculty of law at the uh, University of Colombo, thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. Okay.
Right. I would like to take this moment to thank a couple of people before we conclude uh, completely. I would like to thank the lead generation of uh, Faculty of Law, University of Colombo on behalf of Pro Studies for making this collaborative venture very successful, I would say. I'd also like to thank all of you, the attendants, the participants, and the listeners of this lecture. This wouldn't have been, been made possible and this wouldn't have been so fruitful without your attendance and your participation at this lecture. Once again, I implore you, the audience, to expand your horizons, widen your knowledge, heighten your courage, and to awake the professional in you. From everyone here at Pro Studies, we wish you a pleasant evening and thank you for attending.